This is the story behind the most incredible series of murders to ever occur in the city of Seattle, Washington. You never read about them in your local newspapers or heard about them on your local radio or television station. Why? Because the facts were watered down, torn apart and reassembled. In a word, falsified. Saturday, April 1st, approximately 2.35 a.m. Marissa, one of the three belly dancers at Omar's Tent, a well-known bar in the Pioneer Square area. She was through for the night and on her way to St. James Street, where she could catch the 3 a.m. bus that would take her to her small apartment in the Shoreline Park area. Anxious to get home, she planned to take a shower and go right to bed. She never made it. later in the bar room of the Seattle Press Club, one Tony Vincenzo by name, city editor by profession, bilious grouch by disposition, renewed acquaintance with a dear old comrade of the Fourth Estate. Hi, Charlie. Mr. Vincenzo, how are you? Okay. Good. The usual, Mr. Vincenzo? Yeah, yeah. Where you been living, in a cave? There's a world outside, a world of facts. Stumble on, take a peek at him. Get your brains out of hibernation. Oh, no. Come on, you can't expect to believe this. This doesn't make any sense at all. What's the difference if it makes sense or not? If it's true, you're supposed to be a new man, aren't you? Not a critic. Well, I yeah. am. Uh, take a look at this, then. Just take this one. Take, take a look on. around that corner. See if there isn't someone there that looks like he just came from a road company performance on the front page. And don't lecture me about the responsibility of the press, you cabbage head. I knew more about the press the day I was born than you do now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, can you read English, or do I have to tell you what it says? See, right there. V-A-M-P-I-R-E. Vampire. That's what it says right there. Can you read the official coroner's report? Look at that. B blood drain from a victim's... B There's nothing wrong with me. Vincenzo! Hello, Carl. What are you doing here in Seattle? What did I do in Las Vegas? Well, you fired me. That's what you did in Las Vegas. No, no, no. I didn't fire you. Well, in that case, then, you can hire me. Right, Vincenzo? Take this straight, Mr. Kolchak. No carnival or hoopla tactics on this paper. This isn't Fun Town, USA. This is Seattle. We have standards here. We mind our P's and Q's. We hew precisely to the mark. Uh, yes, sir, uh, Mr. Crossbinding. You can count on me minding your P's and Q's. Yes, sir. So that's what happened to Cotton Mather, huh? Don't underestimate him. Maybe old, but his fangs are potent. <laughs> so, what's my first assignment? What's the matter? Okay. Murder one, three days ago. A belly dancer named Marissa. She was strangled in an alley. Tuesday, 
April 4th. First stop, police headquarters to introduce myself and see if any later information had come in about the Ethel Parker killing. There was nothing new. No useful leads given by the victim's friends, acquaintances, or family. Standard medical examiner's report. So far, the murder was a one-way street to nowhere. I'd like to take a... I'd like to make an appointment with my secretary. Well, I'd like to make an appointment with my secretary. You're going to have to make one. Captain, I'd like to make a little uh, uh, question. Hey, Captain, I'd like... Wait a minute. What's the matter? I want to talk to the captain. Second stop, Omar's tent. No leads. Ethel Parker never mixed with customers, had no known enemies, kept her problems to herself. Unmarried, all her relatives in Massachusetts, she'd left the mainstream of life without making a ripple. Third stop, the apartment of Charisma Beauty. Given name, Gladys Weems, one of the two other belly dancers at Omar's tent. Charisma Beauty? Who are you? Who's there, Wilma? Miss Beauty? Yes, I am. Uh, excuse me? I beg your pardon? My name is Cole Shack, and I'm with the Daily Chronicle. I'd like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Would you like to talk? Uh, no, 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 thank you very much. What I'd like to ask you is, uh... She was... Uh, Something less than helpful, and I soon departed. Made a bit uneasy by the looks directed at me by her husband, Wilma Crankheimer. Fourth stop, the floating premises of Louise Harper, last of the belly dancing trio at the supper club. Your hair is on? Louise Harper. Oh, hi. I'm sorry I can't talk to you now. I'm late for yeah, class. I, uh... Listen, if you want to tell me something, come back later. I must tell you, though, I really don't have any money for extras, so you just be wasting your time. Yeah, but the, uh, Listen, I, uh... I'd like to talk to you. I am so late for class. Professor Graham will kill yeah, me. But... See, my grades are not uh, too good as it is. I, How uh... I'm ever going to graduate, I will never know. There simply is not enough time to do all the things that may, I've got to do. May, 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 may... may I introduce myself? My name is Cole Shack of the Daily Chronicle. When could I ask you some questions about Ethel Parker? You'll have to come by the club. That's just about the only time I have to talk to you. I am so late, I know he's going to flunk me. But thanks for the information. Whee! <laughs> Don't mention it! You know there's been a murder, don't you? I also know that Seattle is the Northwest's largest seaport. Men come and go like the tide, and the murder is probably in Yokohama by now. She was wrong. He was still in Seattle, working up his list of victims. <laughs> Cocktail waitress, Gail Manning. Disposed of sometime after 2 a.m. on the morning of Thursday, April 6th, a block and a half from the first murder. Uh, Captain, Captain, what do you intend to do about this? Who are you anyway? Uh, my name is Kolshak, sir, with the Daily Chronicle. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions just on this. My back. Would, uh. Just when you get in your car, will you wait a minute? Listen, uh, Captain, I got a lot of problems I got to take care of. Strangulation, neat and quick. No new elements was all they told us until the medical examiner's report the next afternoon. In attendance, Captain Roscoe Schubert of the Seattle Police and his staff. Holding forth, Dr. Christopher Webb of the County Medical Examiner's Office. Uh, <clears throat> checking underneath the victim's hairline, we located what appears to be a needle puncture near the base of the skull, from which a small amount of blood was removed. Was there any puncture or loss of blood in Ethel Parker? Uh, we haven't had a chance to check on the puncture yet, but there was apparently a slight decrease in normal blood content. How slight? Well, that's hard to say. Maybe six or seven cc's. Why wasn't it reported? The amount of loss seemed insignificant at the time. But not now. You have a point. Uh, just a minute, Doctor. So who is this clown? Carl I've never Carl. seen him before. What? Call Shack. Daily Chronicle. Don't you remember, Captain? Oh, yeah, yeah. How can I forget? All right, now, Mr. Cole Jack, may we continue? Certainly. Uh, thank you very much. Go ahead, Doctor. As long as we get all the facts this time. <laughs> 
Dissatisfied by what I had heard at the medical examiner's report, I paid a little visit to the morgue and found myself a chatty attendant with a taste for scotch. What he told me made chopped liver of the needle puncture and loss of blood and explained why they hadn't let me look too closely at Gail Manning the night before. Well, uh, no, 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 thank you, thank you, no, no, thank you very much. You go right on ahead, though. Now, look, right off the top, you know, we can't link these two killings unless we know that Ethel Parker has a needle puncture, too. She has. And that's not all. You know something the medical examiner doesn't? Mm -hmm. What? First, you owe me ten bucks for a bottle of scotch. Mm -hmm. What? Yep. Bought for one anecdotal morgue attendant. Okay, keep talking. Hurry up. Uh-huh. Yeah, Ethel Parker not only had a needle puncture in the back of her skull uh, and loss of blood, she also had a broken neck. Well, that's not so unusual in the case of a straggling. Gail Manning also had a broken neck. So what? Maybe I ought to give it to you as a morgue attendant told me. He said that the killer had to be an incredibly strong man. Not only were the necks broken, they were crushed. Oh, read on, read on. Oh, now, now, wait a minute! That's what the man said. On the throats of both victims, there was a residue of rotted flesh as if they had been strangled by a dead man. Friday, April 7th, 10.21 p.m. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, but Louise Harper's hips could move as fast as her mouth. of the East, and now the world-famous Charisma Beauty. Now I'm dead, Charisma. Why should I do that? I like them. Princess of the East? No. Dimwood of the West. Listen, I just can't talk to you right now. I just, I've got to know algebra. Well, I'm great at figures. Bet you are. Go away. You know, if I could find a way not to eat, I sure could save a lot of time. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's pick up talking where we left off. I mean, about the guys, uh, thank you, Charlie, yeah, about, the, about the guys who come to see you dance, the regulars, you know. Did you find any, uh, any strange ones in there, any odd ones, any weirdos? Uh -huh. They're all weird. I mean, they sit there and stare at you with these big, glassy eyes. Any of them could be the strangler, for all I know. What's that? Oh, that's the underground tour. A what? The underground tour goes down underneath Seattle. Oh, you're kidding. Hmm. Yes, there's ruins underneath the streets here, what they call old Seattle. Isn't that right, Wilma? Oh, I don't know. Here. Oh, thank you. I just love these sandwiches. I was talking about the underground, wasn't I? Yeah, you were, honey. There was this big fire back in 18-something or other, and for some strange reason I don't know about, they built it all back up, twice as big as it was before. Mm. Isn't that right, Wilma? Come on, Gladys. It's almost showtime. 
Although research was never one of my favorite pastimes, I'd called on the services of one Titus Berry, guardian of the secrets of Seattle buried in the morgue of the Daily Chronicle. Here we go. Thanks. Most welcome. I envy you. You do? Research. That's where the joy lies. Joy. And the fascination. Let the others scurry about gathering their contemporary bits of gossip. This is where the meat is found. Meat? Yes. For instance, no one has yet mentioned the distinct resemblance between this current series of strangulations and another series in the year 1951. Or was it 52? Yeah, not similar. Oh, extremely similar. Really? He wasn't exaggerating. On March 27th, 1952, one Myra Johns was discovered strangled in an alley in the Pioneer Square area. On March 30th, a second strangulation took place in the same area. On April 2nd, a third. April 5th, a fourth. By April 14th, six women had been strangled, all of them in that area. The stories intimated that certain, quote, bizarre details, unquote, had been repressed by police officials. I wondered what they were. I hardly think we can say we have the same killer now as in 1952. Read on. Again? Again. Incredibly strong and had the rotted features of a corpse? Those are exact quotes, word for word, from Man of Simon Action in 1952. Well, you know I can't print this. Why not? If you don't know the answer to that, Cole Jack, I don't know. I came to Seattle for some peace and quiet. What do I get? You again in another crazy story. Yeah, well, we'll soon see if it's crazy enough. How asked the red-eyed editor knowing Because that. if it is the same killer, he hasn't stopped killing. Sunday, April 9th, 1.42 a.m. Joyce Gabriel, on her way home from a late date, didn't know it was a bad idea to be in the Pioneer Square area late at night. Another one. I just settled down, Miss Gabriel. I never saw anything like that in my life. I, I, I don't know why he didn't chase me after, after he killed her. I just, I just, you know, I, I ran as fast as I could until I, I, I Miss Gabriel, saw you. I, now listen, I'm telling you for the last time, I'm getting sick and tired of you butting into my business. Now, will you please let me ask the questions, Mr. Kolchak? Certainly, Captain. All right. Certainly. What did he look like? Are you deaf? Well, look, get rid of that tape recorder, too. Now, what did he look like? Oh, God, I hope I never see a face like that again. He looked like a dead man. Like a what? Like a dead man. Don't say it. Don't, don't say it. I don't want to hear it. What about the broken necks and the rotted flesh and the throats of the street? I told you I didn't want to hear it. Besides, not official. Not official? Who cares whether it's official or not? Look, you I'm, know it and I know it. I'll buy the possibility that some guy, a killer that strangled the six women in 1952. But a man, Carl, not some kind of super dead man. That's the way he has been described more than once. I don't care if he's been described that way more than twice. Let me finish my lunch. Where are you going? There. Oh! An open invitation to the killer. Listen to this. I intend to walk the streets of the Pioneer Square area every night from now on. Just let him try to kill me, if he dares. He may be sick, but he's not crazy. Jack, 
because you had the thoughtfulness to put my name in your story on the 1952 strangulations. What, uh, what is it? A burning curiosity impelled me to look further back into our files to see if there had been any other strangulations of that nature. 1931? You've got to be kidding. Here it was again, March 29th through April 16th. Six strangulations, certain bizarre information repressed by the authorities. Although a reporter named Jimmy Stacks, God bless him, nosed around until he uncovered the unofficial information that some of the victims were missing some blood and that the killer was supposed to be some kind of superman. Women. You notice that? Always women. Fascinating. Yeah, that's the word, Mr. B. Let's see, 1970, 1952, that's 21 years. 1952 to 1931, that's 21 years. That's right, I hadn't noticed that. That's very observant of you, Mr. Kolchak. Can you be thinking what I'm thinking? Let's have a look. Mr. Barry. It's a cool check. Shall we try for 1889? I refuse to read it. Just, just read the first line. Come on. Just the first line. Come on, do yourself a treat. Come on. Come on. Five identical sets of murders every 21 years since 1889? Identical? Identical. Oh, come on, cold chat. Almost identical. There may be more than five, too. The record stopped in 1887 when the Chronicle was founded. I'm going down to Olympia tomorrow and check out the... Uh, oh, don't, rush, don't rush into that. Wait, wait, wait. Read, 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 the, read the 1910 eyewitness description. I'll read it to you here. Oh, it's great. The maniac had the strength of ten men and the face of a corpse. Cheekbones protruding through the flesh. And that great... Hold it, hold it, hold it. Just hold it. You really and truly expect me to print that story with a corpse that... It's been running around, strangling people and brushing their necks for the past 84 years? Oh. Because the police refused to release the sketch their own artist had made, I talked Vincenzo into hiring an artist of our own. His jaw was heavier, I think. That's closer. But more bone was showing through. Like this? Yes. Is that what he looked like? That's what I saw. Monday, April 10th, 2.07 p.m. Fourth of July came to Seattle early that year. All the fireworks exploding at the police headquarters. Ninety percent of them directed at me and Vincenzo. You know what I call that? Irresponsible yellow journalism. Fast buck journalism. The kind of seamy journalism one might expect to find in some second-rate metropolis. The sordid brand of journalism, which is based not on the public wheel, no, but on the private cash register. Psychologists call it deja vu, the distinct impression of having had the same experience before. That's what it was, all right, in spades. Item. We had no right to throw the public into a panic. Translation. Tourist season was coming up and Seattle couldn't survive without it. Item. We had no evidence to support our statement that there might be a connection between the five sets of murders since 1889. Translation, we knew more than we were supposed to. Item, the authorities were going to keep a watchful eye on us, particularly me, from now on. Translation, after a beef hiatus, I had, once more, taken up permanent residence inside a pressure cooker. Permit me to read you a brief memorandum. Quote, any repetition of this morning's front page assault on the mind and senses will result in the instant dismissal of all responsible persons. Signed, gone. You're almost right. 
How can I let this happen to me again? How could I do it? I don't understand. Will you wait a minute? Will you just wait a minute? We wasted a lot of time. We wasted an awful lot of time fighting tooth and nail in Las Vegas about the obvious. There is no such thing as a vampire. That's what everyone kept saying, and the women kept dying. Now, let's not play that stupid game again. Besides, it's a great story. It's a fabricated story full of screwball speculation. Fabricated speculation? What, have you been sitting on your brain? Just, just give me the facts, Kolchak, or stay away from me. Just the facts. Step number one in my fact-finding project took me to the main library, where I spent the rest of the evening checking through their microfilm collection of Seattle's newspapers. The murder trail apparently came to an end in 1889. But I found out something very interesting. As near as I could make it out, every set of murders had taken place over a period of 18 days, which meant that our killer, whoever or whatever he was, only had a week and a day to find his last three victims. That night, about 11.45, he reduced the number to two. Hold it, mister. Identification, please. Yeah, identification, sure, right, uh, right here. tour of Seattle's forgotten city beneath the modern streets of Seattle. That mouthful was devised by the man I'm about to introduce, author, journalist, Mr. Bill Spidell. Thank you, young man. Welcome to Seattle's underground tours, folks. Before I go on, I want to tell you about Mother damnable. After completely striking out of my efforts to get Schubert to return my film of last night's wipeout of the Seattle police, I decided to try another angle. Make room for the underground. I telephoned my belly dancing undergraduate friend and asked her to attend an afternoon tour of the underground with me. Confession of a newsman, chapter one. Her being with me had nothing to do with the story. Those kids uh, from Seattle High School spent five successive 
Saturdays, back in the spring of 1965. Cleaning up no less than 10 tons of debris down here so that people like yourselves wouldn't break your necks while walking around. All right, watch your step through here. You gentlemen can help the ladies, huh? 20 Twice a day when the uh, tides came in, the sewer system backed up and came right in with it, flooding every water closet, turning it into a fountain. Now, I tell you, kids in those days weren't raised on Dr. Spock. They were raised in the tide table. Hey, watch your step. Let's go this way. It was like another world down there, a world of yesterday. The sidewalks and storefronts just as they'd been left after the fire in 1889. Windows built to admit the light, admitting only darkness now. Ground floors of office buildings now, the unused cellars of those buildings. The tomb of old Seattle just beneath the living streets of what Seattle is today. I'm all right. Listen, have you seen anybody else around here who wasn't with the tours? Yeah. Yeah, who? You too. Funny. Very funny. Well, if you do see someone or uh, something around here, you uh, get in touch with me at uh, this number. I'll give you 20 bucks. Uh, here's a down payment. <laughs> I could live three months on that. Five bucks. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. <clears throat> on me. I still don't think it's a good idea for you to be working nights. You know, I've seen this nut in action. Oh, terrific. You're going to pick up my tuition? It's very funny. Very funny. I just don't get it. Where does it go between killings? I mean, we didn't find anything down in the underground. No. I don't understand it. How can he run like a track star, have superhuman strength, and look like a stiff? Now, what does he do with all that blood? I mean, it's like some kind of recurring nightmare. It's all happened to me before. What are you talking about? Well, last year in Las Vegas, when I was working for Tony Vincenzo, I uncovered a series of murders that turned out to have been committed by a vampire. <laughs> no, a real vampire. 
A real out of the coffin at night go for the jugular type vampire. You don't believe me? Mm -mm. No, well, neither did the cops up there. Neither did the FBI. Neither did Tony Vincenzo until finally they had to. Well, as it turned out, however, they put a cap on my story, prevented me from writing about which I had seen with my own eyes by hanging a murder rap over my head. Murder? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, finally drove a wooden stake into the vampire's heart. Well, what do you think? What do I think? I think those people will remember this elevator ride for the rest of their lives. Hmm. Two, let's go. I don't know. I'm beginning to wonder whether maybe it isn't them. Maybe it's me. Listen, I think I know somebody you should see. There's this lady who's a teacher at the university. Well, she teaches anthropology. And she's a buff on just, I mean, every crazy subject there is in the world. Yeah? Ghosts, demons, <laughs> vampires, and ghouls. You know, you just name it. You probably won't be too crazy about her, but she's got to be the one you talk to. Yeah? What's her name? Professor Crabwell. What? How can a man over a hundred years old retain his vitality? Is it possible? If it were possible, I'd be sitting here an 80-year-old sex pot. <sighs> well, however, staying young was not their purpose. Alchemy was conceived as an exalted notion, man at one with the universe. And will you please sit down? Yes, yes, of course. These men led Spartan lives, living in the most humble of quarters, eating the most humble of foods. The Count Saint Germain, for instance, existed on a diet which consisted solely of oatmeal, groats, white meat of chicken, and a little wine. It just seems to me that a diet like that would make a man old before his time. On the contrary. He remained young for a number of years, in addition to which he was said to have possessed Almost superhuman strength. Tell me, what other, uh, what other ingredients are in this elixir of life? Milk or meat, celandine or honey, red wine vinegar, hair, sweat, blood. What kind of blood? What do you mean, what kind of blood? Human blood, of course. What are you smiling at? Hi there. Got a moment? What are you doing here? Just wanted to talk with you, man. What about? The elixir of life. <sighs> Go to journalism school, my father said. It's a good, sound, down-to-earth profession. Don't you want to hear this? What I like to do is raise tulips for a living, but there's not too much of a demand. Suppose an elixir of life could actually be produced. How do you think it would work? I mean, do you think, do you think that, that one treatment of it would cause everlasting youth? Or do you think that, that uh, well, periodic treatments might be required, say... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't tell me. Let me guess. Every 21 years? Good guess. Now, suppose at the end of this 21-year period, the man who took the magic elixir began looking a little uh, moldy, you know, kind of like what he really did look like, actually, a 100-year-old man. Suppose he had to make a new batch of the elixir and had to make it within a period of 18 days. Suppose that the one ingredient he didn't have was blood. Very good. Suppose he had to go out late every night to get that blood. Suppose he got it from the basis of his victim's skulls with a hypodermic needle. And suppose he was so strong that when he strangled his victims, he crushed their necks. And suppose his fingertips were starting to decompose and left fragments of them on the women's throats. And suppose you flap your arms and fly right out that door. And suppose you check on the victim and you discover what the word fat means, Cole Jack. Fat! Fat! As I rode home from work that night, I wondered where the killer was and if my theory about him was true. Partly true or, as Vincenzo would have it, factless, hopeless, and useless. I wondered when and how he'd get his fifth victim since the entire area was being guarded so closely now. I didn't have to wonder long.
Thursday, April 13th, 125 a.m. The dressing room in Omar's tent. Charisma Beauty was plain old Gladys Weems again. Dead, strangled with a broken neck, blood syringe from the base of her skull. Wilma Crankheimer was still in shock. So was Louise Harper. She had found the body after her performance. And I wasn't doing so well myself. Captain, I've got to talk to you about something. Hey, wait a minute. Come on. This is very important. Captain. I'm sorry. Captain Schubert is very busy. Yeah, well, i got to see him. I said you cannot go I'm in going there. there, sweetheart. What's, What's going busy? on here? I told him you were busy, sir. I've been trying to see you since 1.30 this morning, and I'm not going to leave until I do. It's all right, Sheila. I'm sorry, sir. It's all right, Sheila. You've got to put police women on the waterfront streets at night. Do I, Mr. Yeah, Patrick? you do. You got five days in which to catch the killer, otherwise he's going to disappear. Oh, is he, Mr. Colton? Yeah, he is, he is. Every 21 years since 1889, he has killed six women in 18 days precisely. Precisely, Mr. Colton? Precisely. Precisely. Well, no doubt we lack your eagle-eyed perception, but somehow we fail to see the exact precise pattern you keep babbling about. Now, in 1889, there was no evidence that the murders were committed over an 18-day period, or for that matter, that they were even related. You yeah, check? Yes, we do a little research, too, sometimes. Now, to continue, in 1910, there was blood loss reported in only three of the victims. Yeah, what about the description the of the... The description of the murder was made by a mental defective in his cups and... What about the 1952 descriptions? Were those made by a mental defective in his cups? He was a bank president! In 1952, there were eight murders committed during an 18-day period. Now, what does that do to your theory? Two of them by stabbing, which invalidates... And after the sixth strangulation, an eyewitness described the murderer as being, quote, rather handsome, unquote. Oh, uh, you mean you missed that? Well, I... Well, the witness obviously made a mistake. I mean, he had to. Well, did he? Huh? Yeah. Tell me something, then. If it's the same killer, why no signs of rotted flesh on the throat of last night's victim? Um, and one last question. Why am I wasting my time on you? Facts obviously mean nothing to you at all. There is one last fact, Captain. By next Tuesday, that killer's going to disappear for 21 years. And the way your police have got the Pioneer Square area bottled up, he isn't even going to show his face. Which face is that, huh? The rotted one of your so-called super killer your newspaper saw fit to print? So-called? So I saw that so-called super killer wipe up the streets with your so-called police force. I had pictures to prove it that you wouldn't let me print. Tell me something, Kolchak. How long have you been in Seattle? What difference does that make? What have that got to do? How long have you been with the Chronicle? Oh, a little less than two weeks. A little less than two weeks, yeah, huh? Well, and in that brief time, you have ascertained exactly how we should conduct this case. Well, I've been a reporter for 22 years. And I've been a police officer for 30. Well, then why don't you retire? Listen, I don't like you, Mr. Kolchak. You might say I dislike you monumentally. Now, you have barged around this building as though it were your own private club. You've interfered with police officers while they were trying to perform their duty. You strewn the streets of Seattle with a journalistic garbage. You stepped on toes, muscled in, pushed, usurped, and generally conducted yourself with all the aplomb of a one-man Gestapo. Gestapo? Yes, Gestapo. Now listen, if I see or hear from you again for quite some time, I promise you I'll personally have you thrown in jail and get your arm off my clock. I'm telling you, you've only got five days left. And I'm telling you to get out and stay out. Cease, mister. Cease, desist, and vanish, or else. At least search the underground. The killer's down there. That's where he isn't. That... The underground was searched. Nothing at all was found. Sheila! Yes, we did that without consulting you. I hope that's all right, Mr. Kolchak. Sheila, show Mr. Kolchak the door. Good day, sir. Coming, Mother. I warned you about bugging the police department, didn't I? Yeah, didn't so, I? So what? So, so, so Schubert's office just called Grossbeiner. Grossbeiner called me. And once again, thanks to you, I'm frying on a griddle. Why? Why? Are you for real? 
You barge into Schubert's office, you tell him how to run his case, you tell him he's suppressing the news, and you ask why? He is suppressing the news. He doesn't know how to run the case. The killer is down there, Tony. He is down there well, what in they the get underground. Him out of there? Because he is hidden away someplace that nobody knows. Then how the heck can they get out of there? By breaking open the walls. I don't know. Listen, Crossbinder's got some influence in town, hasn't he? What about it? You have got to talk him in to pressuring the police, forcing them to do what I want them to do. <laughs> you know what you just said? Well, of course I know what I just said. I just said it, didn't I? No, you don't know. It's finally happened, Kolchak. You've got schizoid. No. You'll be wearing robes in the crown no, next. No, no, no. I'll tell you what's finally happened, Tony. You have lost your guts. You have sold out. Sold out? Sold out. Why, you miserable, egocentric... You are off the story. I am what? You heard me. You are off the story. You know something, Tony? You're getting old. You're getting very old. Out. Out! Out! Get out! <laughs> Just one small item, Mr. Kolchak. Mark Twain. Fifth paragraph down. Fifth paragraph down, two, three. Oh, yeah. Mr. Twain noted with typical dryness of tone that he had a most intriguing conversation with, with, uh, with a local physician who claimed that physical immortality... Oh, this is very good, Mr. Barry, very good. And physical mortality was not only possible, but probable, indeed practical. Mr. Twain remarked, yes, the physician's name is Dr. Richard Malcolm. You wouldn't have anything on this Richard Malcolm, would you? Just one small item. Dr. Richard Malcolm was a member of the original staff of the Westside Mercy Hospital when it opened in 1882. There's the original story and photograph. The Civil War? He was a surgeon in the Union Army. <laughs> Is this hospital still standing? Oh, I don't. I believe so, Mr. Kolchak. Uh, I, uh, I think there's a clinic there now. I took a fast trip to the clinic, hoping they might have the record files from Westside Mercy Hospital stashed away in their cellar somewhere. I asked Mr. Barry to keep checking his own records while I was gone and find out what else he could about Dr. Richard Malcolm. I never had to search the cellar for those records. I found my answer just inside the lobby door. Sir, if you don't get down from there this instant, I'll call the police. Did you hear me, sir? All right, then. All right, then. Call the police. Tell them we have a vandal here. Tell them to get here right away. Now, you get down from there this instant, sir. Malcolm Richards, M.D., the doctor's saint of the waterfront, founder of the Richards Free Clinic, also known as Richard Malcolm, M.D., late of the Union Army. Our killer from time. This is dreadful, Mr. Kolchak. On the contrary, Mr. Barry. There he is, officer. Tony. It is to be regretted, Mr. Kolchak, that leg irons and mouth blocks were outlawed some years back. Now, will you wait a minute, please? Will you take these things off? I warned you, Kolchak. Congratulations, Kolchak. You have plumbed a new depth, the desecration of a saint. For heaven's sake, I did not invent the resemblance between Dr. Malcolm Richards and Dr. Richard Malcolm. I did not invent the fact that that West Side Mercy Hospital, which Dr. Richard Malcolm was a staff member, is on the same spot as the Malcolm Richards Clinic. Why not an expose on Dr. Schweitzer, Mr. Coach, or the lowdown on Mahatma Gandhi? As for this eternal youth garbage, I hate it. Yeah, well, I can see why. What did you say? Uh, now, hold on. We're not here for any personal vituperation. You know that word? What? Vituperation. That's what I said. I pronounced it right. 
Now listen, Kolchak. You've been arrested. You're about one one hundredth of an inch of being thrown in jail. And... Well, there he is. Now who's this? Hey, Mr. Barry, come in, come in, come in. Yes, I've been waiting for you. Come on. Yes, yes. Do you uh did you did you did you did, did, did you get it? Yes, I thought perhaps. Uh... Well, you, you thought well, you thought right, Mr. Barry. <laughs> Who is this man? Don't you know him? He works for you. Uh, down in research, sir, for 35 years. Good God. Yeah, and research, of course, being the meat of it. Yeah, here we are. Mr. Richard Malcolm lived in New York City until 1868 when he moved to Seattle. Oh, very good, Mr. Barry, very good. Several months before he left uh, New York City, that is, six women were strangled over a period of 18 days, precisely. Their larynxes were crushed and their... Their uh, necks were broken. Two of them had small wounds on the base of their skull. 1868, I might add, is exactly 21 years before the first group of Seattle killings, Mr. Vincenzo. Item, following the fire of 1889, in which the wife, stepson, and daughter uh, died of smoke insula inhalation, uh, Dr. Richard Malcolm disappeared. 1889, as we know, just happens to be the year in which the first group of six killings occurred, Mr. Vincenzo. Yes, in 1910, doc, uh, Dr. Malcolm Richards appeared in the by now defunct West Side Mercy Hospital, of which, as noted, Dr. Richard Malcolm was formerly a member of the staff, and built his clinic over the original site. 1910, by coincidence, just happens to be the year in which the second group of six killings occurred, Mr. Vincenzo. Oh, Jack. Again, more broken necks and more missing blood. Now listen, Kolchak. Jack. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. In 1931... Following reports that he had developed some kind of a, quote, strange degenerative skin disease, unquote, Dr. Malcolm Richards disappeared. Oh, 1931, just by coincidence, happens to be the year in which the third group of similar uh, killings occurred, Mr. Vincenzo. Your photos, photos. Do you, do you have any photographs? Ah. You'll uh, excuse the uh, clumsiness of the hands, but my wrists are slightly encumbered by your bracelets. Now, this photograph of Dr. Richard Malcolm and the uh, slightly doctored photograph of Dr. Malcolm. Richards are identical down to the white scar above the right eyebrow. Huh? Now, this photograph was taken during the Civil War when Dr. Richard Malcolm was a surgeon with the Union Army. The photograph of Dr. Malcolm Richards was taken in 1926. It showed a man in his 40s. Now, how can a man almost 90 look like a man in his 40s? Facts, gentlemen. Facts. Well? Yes. Well? You shut up. Uh, I mean, uh, well. Fascinating. All right. What are we supposed to do now? Congratulate you? Find him, mister. Go down underground and search for him. You haven't searched enough. And put some police women in the area. Lure him out of his lair. And, Mr. Publisher, you might consider printing the stories. They are news, sir, not hearsay. They are news. That will be enough, Mr. Kolchak. Perhaps, Mr. Kolchak, it would be a good idea if you uh, stepped outside for a moment. Delighted, sir, delighted. If I could get my jewelry removed. All right. Judd, get him out of here. Take the handcuffs off him. Thank you. I just await your decision, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Well, I'm not. Mr. Grossbinder, it'll be done. You can depend on it. Come on, Judd. Oh, boy. 
Okay, Carl. I don't know how I did it, but I got you off the hook. You did? Yeah. You're a genius, Tony. You're a genius. Now, what, what, about, what about the story? There is no story. What? That's it, Carl. There is no story. From now on, they're going to handle the whole thing their own way. You, you, you're going to... Hand... I'll kill him! Oh, Jack! Don't, didn't they hear me? Didn't they hear what I said? Don't they know what's going to happen? I mean, if they, if they don't lure him out, if they don't get Malcolm out of there, he's going to get his six killed somewhere else, and he's going to disappear for 21 years. Didn't they hear me? Don't they know it's going to happen? They don't die in panic in the entire city just for your sake, Cole Shack. Period! Now, your next assignment, you know, you have your next day. assignment, courtesy of Mr. Llewellyn Crossbinder, your next assignment, bright and early you're tomorrow morning, side. you're covering the Daffodil Festival in Puyallup. And you're lucky to get that! Puyallup. It was with deep regret that I chose to forego the joys of daffodils in Puyallup, but I had other plans. Saturday, April 15th, 2 a.m., we started out. One belly dancing undergraduate and one reporter who, despite his air of spit-in-their-eye confidence, hoped to heavens he wasn't hastening said undergraduate to her doom. It didn't help my conscience any that Louise Harper had agreed immediately to help me, angered as she was by the death of both her co-performers. Like you're suspicious or something? Just walk natural. Yeah. Go on, I'll be right behind you. I'll be right behind you. Just act casual. The first three nights passed without any particular incident. Most of the time was spent trying to duck the police. On the fourth night, things began to happen.
cold check. Oh, the party's man. over. Get in the car. John, what are you doing, Doc? Why don't you leave me alone? Get out of my arrest. way. Get in the I'm car. Get your hands off me. Get them. Don't push. Don't Shut push. up. station was a circus of activity, a three-ring madhouse of reaction to the sixth kill. Even Captain Schubert seemed to know they'd had it now. The saving a miracle, their prey had gone to Earth again and wasn't going to show his corpse-like face for another 21 years. A certain reporter being bailed out knew it too. Knew it and was fit to be tied by it. Hey, Schubert, okay? Okay, okay Schubert! I told him. I told him. Near you? Oh, Jack. I told him, but would he listen? No, no, he didn't listen. No. I've been a policeman for 37 years and an idiot for twice that oh, long. Oh, Jack, you were supposed to be in Puyallup for the Daffodils. Where? Oh, Jack, I'd like to leave you here forever. I'd like to see they lock you up in a jail cell for a million years. And if you don't shut your mouth, if Vigenio, you don't... Vigenio, 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 what's the matter with you? You ought to see a doctor, you know. I'm serious. You sound terrible. Awful. What have you done to that poor man? I have never seen anyone so close to total stark insanity before. He just disappeared. We had him cornered in the alleys behind the Richards Clinic, and he disappears. Just... Vincenzo was so upset it took me an hour to get rid of him, and then only because I promised to go straight home to bed. Maybe no one else knew what was going on, but I was sure that I did. Our man had to have a way in and out of some secret part of the underground. And the basement of his old clinic had to be it.
You're not going to go down there. You stay here. What is it? Looks like a big air shaft down here. Where does it go? Well, all over. I'm going to check it out. Just when I thought I'd finally struck out, I found it. It's in there. Give me 30 minutes and call the police and tell them where I am. What are you going to do? I'm going to get my exclusive. What do you think? I think you're crazy. That's what I think. You just do what I tell you. I got to get going. hidden city beneath Seattle's underground. I was descending to the world of yesterday, the world of the 19th century, of bustle pads and high crown hats and Queen Victoria. The private world of Dr. Richard Malcolm.
you, you Who are you? Uh, uh, Carl Kolchak, a Daily Chronicle. How did you get here? Through the, uh, the cellar of your clinic. Clinic? I have no clinic. Why do you say that? But, but you are. You are Dr. Richard Malcolm. I've seen you somewhere before. Oh, well, you almost killed me the other day in the alley. What are you doing here? Uh, what am I doing here? Well, I, uh, I thought I'd drop in and uh, find out about you, you know, <clears throat> so I could tell my readers. Your what? My readers? His readers. Did you hear that? Nobody is ever going to hear from you again. Well, I think I'll go now. You profane my world, sir. I will not permit you to live here, to stay here, to exist here. I'm, I'm just a dummy porter doing his job. You grovel nicely, Mr. Coal shack, sir. <clears throat> mm. uh, Daily Chronicle. Mm. Sir. So you want a story, do you? He wants a story, darling. What do you think? Hmm? Oh, we'll see if there's time. Yes, we have time. Why not? Hmm? Why not? It seems only fitting that one other person in the world ought to know, ought to know the facts. Before he dies. Hmm? Yes, Mr. Coach. Hmm. I'll not bore you with the details of how I evolved my formula. Suffice it to say that the attitude which ultimately made it work for me was the blood of women removed from their brains in the seven seconds following their death. I found that six were required to supply the quantity of blood that was needed for the 18-day period in which the elixir was prepared and consumed. In 1868, I first took the elixir. Then, believing that my immortality was assured, I decided to perfect and refine the, the formula in the hopes of bestowing its benefits on mankind. No longer circumscribed by time and death, what wonders on this earth could men not then achieve? Yes. In 1889, my world collapsed. Yes, 1889. <clears throat> Your uh, family died and you began to age. Are you going to listen? Are you going to listen? Or are you going to interrupt? No, no. L listen, listen. I discovered that the effects of the elixir were not permanent. I began to age. I had to kill again. Restore myself. That's why you, uh, that's why you look the way you do now, isn't it? Yes. Stage? By stage, in 18 days, that's the way the elixir works. Yes. And then I shall have 21 more years to make its effects permanent. 21 more years? That's all you're ever going to have, isn't it? That's not true. I'll find the answer eventually. 
Eventually. How many more women are going to have to die? <coughs> What's a few lives compared to immortality, Mr. Kolchak? This is the sixth and final dosage. I shall take it shortly, and the revitalization shall be complete. If I don't take this final dosage now, the process will reverse itself. But I will take it. between this town and Vegas? But they saw it, Tony. They all saw it. I mean, even, even Schubert saw it. Carl, no one in Seattle's going to admit that a dead man's roaming around that city killing people since 1889, but I was stupid enough to think that they would. So this is it, huh? And I'm out of a job. Is that right, Vincenzo? And that I feel bad about, Carl. Yeah, why should you feel bad, Tony? I mean, you're still working. Oh, I don't deserve that, Carl. If you had any guts left, any at all, you'd go upstairs and... All right, Carl, I've had enough. So have I. Don't ever do me any more favors. Do you any favors? Why, oh, you miserable, ungrateful. Ungrateful? What do you want me to do? Thank you? No. Just get out of here. Get out. And next time you do me a favor, here, you see me again, just keep walking. With pleasure. And thanks, Vincenzo. Thanks for nothing. Hello. Oh. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Crosswinder. Right. 
I'll be right up. So there it is, another tale of defeat snatched from the jaws of triumph. Another case of virtue unrewarded, of dishonesty being the best policy, injustice Will rampant... You shut up and put that stupid recorder away? Let me get some sleep. Get that story published. God, don't tell me when I'm going to get published. And nobody's going to kill this story. It's already been killed, the whole Jack Berry. Not this one, no, sir. I'd like to see somebody shut me up on this one. Can anybody shut you up? Mr. Vicenzo, you are a passenger in this car. This is my automobile. You remember what you said? I never want to see you again. I never want to talk to you again, remember? Yeah, I remember. That was before I was five. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, don't worry about it, Tony. You're going to love it, New York. New York? New York. Yeah, that's where we're going. And you're lucky to be going with me. I suppose... I should consider myself lucky, too. That's right. Oh, cold check. Do you know that I have heard just about all I want to take from you or even hear ever again? You think you've got problems? Here I was, one semester shy of getting my degree in psychology, and what happens? You show up outside my house for one day. <laughs> mouth, all mouth, cold check. Compared to you, I am tongue-tied. And before I know what's going on, there I am being yelled at by that... That captain of police. Yada da yada da yada da. Peach, can I have some peach? 